Don't be afraid to fail. Fail young. You have time to recover. You learn from it. You know, like, I don't want to start a new career at 50. Could you have five different careers before you're 30? Absolutely. Find what you like, find what you don't like. Welcome to Running is Cheaper Than Therapy podcast. I am your host, Dr. Weta L. Brown. I inspire and promote movement. I explain how running adds to life from a mental wholeness aspect, how obstacles can be overcome in life to make it to your finish line. Welcome to Running is Cheaper Than Therapy, episode 97. Today, I welcome David Redmond, who is a triathlete, although he says he considers himself more of an athlete. He has completed four half-distance Ironman races, 70.3, two full-distance Ironman races. He began his multi-sport journey in 2011. As a child growing up in southern Indiana, he did play football and basketball. He continued to play football in college. Following college, he took up boxing, but it was after his divorce he decided to try triathlons. He connected with the Atlanta triathlon community. He did an indoor triathlon as his first experience in progress. He found the support in the triathlon community to encourage him to continue his multi-sport journey. Initially, he thought, maybe I'll just do a half, but he was encouraged to continue and completed two full-distance Ironman races. Outside of training for triathlons, he dabbles in acting. He's been in Snake in the Grass, Love Match Atlanta, Bravo and the Resident. He hopes to expand his acting endeavors once his son graduates from high school. He also picked up the guitar during COVID. He's a bit of an adrenaline junkie. We have that in common. He recently ran with the Bulls in Spain for his birthday. Please welcome David to the show. Well, thanks for joining me today. No worries. Glad I could be on. So let's start with your formative years. Where are you originally from? So I'm from Southern Indiana, a small town called Evansville, which is on the border of Kentucky and Indiana. When you were growing up, did you participate in any sports? I pretty much played every sport. So a little baseball, mainly basketball and football. All the way through high school and then through college, I played at football at Murray State University, which is in the southwest corner of Kentucky. So was football your favorite sport? Actually, basketball is my favorite sport. I just wasn't as good at basketball as I was at football. So what position did you play in football? Uh, I was a wide receiver. You played football the whole time in college? Correct. All four years. So after college, did you participate in any sports? For a while, nothing just worked out, did nothing. It was just part of my normal routine. And then probably at uh, 35, 40, no, before that, about 30, I picked up boxing just as a hobby to mix it up and play, you know, do something different. So nothing major, just went to a gym, did some training, a little sparring. So what got you interested in endurance sports? I got divorced in 2010 or separated, and I found myself coming home every day, sitting on the couch, eating, falling asleep. So hereditary, I have high blood pressure, and I knew that if I didn't make some changes, things wouldn't go well. Sitting there watching TV, and I saw one of the Ironman competitions come on. I watched it, and I was like, oh, I think I could probably do that. I think that same week, I went to a, a seminar at a place called Atlanta Triathlon Club. Got started. They had a great intro program. They had the cycling, the training, the wasn't quite one-on-one, but some group training sessions, pool, just everything you need to get started. So that was in 2011. A year later, I did my first pool triathlon, and I've been going ever since. So did you know how to swim already? Barely. I could swim the length of the pool, and that was huffing and puffing. So that that was the biggest challenge, as you probably know. For people of color, just learning to swim is, you know, we don't often grow up in the pool or going to the beach and stuff. So that was one of the, the things I liked about it. So biking, yeah, running, yeah. Not swimming and being able to do a triathlon was like, okay, to do all three, uh, that's a test. 
you started with the pool and then how did you progress after the pool? Much of Metro Atlanta is a, is a huge training triathlon community. And so I got acclimated by going out to uh, some of the lakes out here. There's a guy, his name was Pete. I'm not sure what Pete's last, but it was a, a program called Swim with Pete. And you go out on a Saturday. That was my first open water swim with Pete. Yeah, they've got kayak support. There's a bunch of people that get swim buoy. It's about as safe as you can get. Did a few swim with Pete's, got acclimated. Then you just kind of gradually move up to a couple of river swims. You do uh, maybe an Olympic swim out in one of the triathlons here or something like that. And then eventually my first Ironman was New Orleans. Tell me about that, Ray. So it was like a, a dishwasher. Whatever reason, the swell was ridiculous. You couldn't see five feet in front of you. It was hard. I think I finished in like 110, maybe 111, like right at the cutoff. Mm -hmm. And then the bike was fine going out. I had not listened to most of the people who I trained with. So I had like little to no nutrition. I had some, oh, I'll get some stuff on the course. No. So I had some... A couple of chews, no real nutrition plan, and just kind of gutted it out. And I had a an old road bike. They even had clip-on shoes. So what was bad about the bike? No, it wasn't prepared, nutrition, and there was a, a huge headwind coming back in. Yeah, so tailwind was fine. Headwind, it was, you know, maybe, I don't know, 17, 18 miles an hour for an hour and a half. And I wasn't that good a rider at that point. So what made you continue on? As soon as you got done, we had a black triathlete meeting. We had a post-dinner celebration. And they're like, oh, you did 70.3. You, you need to go ahead and sign up for, for a full. And guess what I did? Like a dummy. Next year, I did a 70.3 and then followed that up with a full. So the following year, I did Chattanooga half as a prep. And then I did Chattanooga full as my first full. What year was that? 2017. I, I had no intents of ever doing an Ironman. So I spent three or four years just doing sprints and Olympics. And then 2016 was my first year actually stepping up and doing a real a real race. Except for the COVID years, I've done either a half or a full every year since then. So do you have a favorite race? I like Chattanooga. Full or half? Both. There, It's a downriver swim, which made it easy. It's not as hilly. I also did Louisville. And you wouldn't think that Chattanooga would have less elevation than Louisville. But I think you did Louisville as well. It was crazy. So Chattanooga once you get through the swim, it's a very scenic route. It's hot, but it's it's a doable race. But I heard the run was awful. The run's crazy. There's a couple of nice hills. You start off out of transition, go straight uphill. Out of the three, which would you say is your strongest discipline? The bike. The swim, I think, is the easiest because I've learned to swim and float. I'm not fast, but I don't get tired at all. I hate running. Why? Playing football, I never ran distances. I've still, to this day, I've run... Four half marathons, all half Ironmans, and two marathons, both Ironman races. The longest I've ever ran is uh, the Peace Tree. I did a 10K. I don't do any any running more than just training enough to get, get to the finish line. Okay. So tell me about your worst race and why. Why would you say it was your worst? <sighs> worst race. Mm -hmm. It was probably New Orleans because I wasn't prepared mentally or or nutritionally so physically i could do all the stuff had done all the training whatever but again i planned real poor didn't you know nutrition was awful my shoes at that point i wasn't smart enough i think i wore like a pair of nikes or something like everything about that race was just newbie just just none of it made any sense at all when i look back like how did i even finish but it actually wasn't a bad i finished under seven hours so it actually wasn't a bad time after your mistakes, did you go like reevaluate? Let me do this by talking to people. Or did you have a formal coach or like how did you progress in your training? I've never had a formal coach. Just listen to people asking questions. So I asked more questions. So I knew between the cramps, I needed to figure out what was wrong. Like, oh, you need to do salt. And I still don't do it as well as I should, but I don't eat on the bike. I just don't do it. So during the fulls, I stopped both times and got my special needs bag, which had peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. But on the bike, when I should be like popping jelly beans or whatever, choose, I don't do it. And so that sets me up for failure on the run. I think I'm going to do one this year. I'll try to remember. But, you know, I get spoiled. I go on the Silver Comet. You know, I'll eat breakfast. I'll ride. I'll come back. I'll run whatever. Uh, do a, a brick. And then I'll just go eat after that. I don't ever think you need to practice exactly going to run the race. And it's had horrible results. 
Tell me, how was the progression from the half to the full? Uh, first full was Chattanooga. I did great in the half in Chattanooga. So I ran that in under under six hours. That's by far my best race ever. I trained well, nutrition, did, did whatever I needed to do. The first, to get from there to the full, pretty much everything doubles. So, you know, every day is a brick. Every, every day is, you got two disciplines. And working a full-time job, and I was coaching my son's football team, just finding time to get the training in. Suck. But again, there's a huge community here. There's a bunch of people training for races. So, hey, let's go, let's go do 80 miles Friday or Saturday. Let's go swim uh, Lake Lanier. Let's go do this. So there's the community help. And then again, there's a, I don't know how many, 10 to 12 Ironman finishers in Metro Atlanta, just in, in, the, in the community. So a lot of tribal knowledge there. You said with work and with coaching your son that it was that was hard to, as far as the time. How did you find the dedication to continue on? So I'm a pretty disciplined person. I just knew I wanted to do it. So once I started and I committed to it, you know, once you pay that entry fee for the race, you're, you're going to do the race. There was no doubt I was going to do it. The good part about when I coached my son is I had done most of the training through the summer. The race was in September. So by the time I got to late July and August, most of it was just taper. And uh, I had planned ahead and I had already done a couple century rides and, you know, I felt good about it. Like even now, I need structure. When I don't have structure, I'm, you know, I'm just drinking beer, sitting on the couch, watching TV, eating wings. So, But I know if, uh, hey, tomorrow I got to go, I got to run at some point where I have to ride. You know, my eating is going to be more disciplined. I'm going to drink more water. I'll just be more prepared. And that carries over to everything. So that's why I try to always stay somewhat busy. Like actually, I just swam like a... between when we're supposed to meet now, stay in shape. Like I said, I think I'm going to do a race in May. But even if I don't, I still like the structure. So what do you find the most joyful aspect of endurance racing and triathlons? It's been that, was it, 0.001%. That, that's, a, you know, the bragging rights. So not many people run marathons, let alone do Ironman. And so you've done, you do multiple, people are like, oh, wow. You know, the look on people's faces, you get those, uh, Oh my God, I can't believe you did that. Especially black people. We get, we get different looks because they don't, a lot of people don't think we swim. So anyway, all that being said, like just being able to just say, yeah, I kind of casually, yeah, I did a, did an Ironman. You know, you get the interesting fact thing at work or interesting fact in group settings and you say, oh, yeah, I've done a couple of Ironmans. And people are like, wow. I'm, I'm, oh, okay. Really? Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Mm, okay. Have you had any major injuries during your endurance? I have not. I've been fortunate. Not a single one. No bike falls, no back, no knee, no ankles. Haven't even lost a toenail yet. Good for you. You are blessed. (laughs) (laughs) Really, you are. In season six, I will continue the segment as the doc. If you have any questions or concerns related to muscular skeletal health, please email me at running is cheaper than therapy olb at gmail.com send me a social media message via instagram facebook twitter or go to my website at www.weouilife l-i-v we o-u i love dot com click on the prompt and leave a voice message select messages will be aired and answered you call yourself an adrenaline junkie and call yourself more of an athlete than a triathlete. What do you mean by that? So this past summer, uh, as part of my 50th celebration, I went to Spain and I ran with the Bulls. So that's been on my bucket list for a while. Actually, I actually have a friend. He's actually a fellow triathlete. He's actually the one that it's like, hey, let's do it. And then before that, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Four of us went. Only the two triathletes actually ran with the Bulls. So we... We were right there on the street with the bull five feet away. So how was that experience? I mean, when you (laughs) trampled over? It all sounds good in theory until you actually experience. So from where the bulls start to where they end is only like a mile and a half. So it's not that long, but it's a small corridor. So it's like two sidewalks. That's all you have. So there's room for the bull and then maybe about two, three feet on each side. So if the bull gets corralled one way or the other, you're going to get gore. They close all the doors. There's no place to climb. There's nothing. So they let off a firecracker and it's way, you know, where I was standing, it's way 
way down this corridor. Mm-hmm. And then you're sitting there. And then about two minutes later, you see those disaster movies where people are just running for their lives. That's what it's like. There's no screaming. People are like, you know, yelling. <laughs> and, then, and then you hear like thunder. And then next thing you know, the, the bull's on you. So you have to kind of get a running start. There's people falling. And so in Pom- Pomplona, it is, uh, it's, like on, it's like the Super Bowl. It's on TV. There's You run eight days or there's eight runs and it's televised and they replay it and they show broken up into sections. And it's like, here's this section. They'll, so we were fortunate. We got there day three was when we ran. Up to that point, no one had got gored. Day four and day five, I think people got gored on both of them. Did you do it again? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> we might do it again. So it, it, it's some people, other people want to go. But we did it smart. We had a um, part of our tour package. We had a guy who was a professional runner show us, like, tell us, like, you don't want to be here. You don't want to stand here. And the best advice they can give you is if you fall or if you stumble, just lay down in the fetal position. It, it, like the bull will jump over you. The bill we're in, the, there was a guy fell right in front of us. He just got in the fetal position. You're like, oh, that guy's, no, that guy's smart. Because as soon as you raise up, the bull's just going to run you over. Bull's, you know, thousand pounds running full speed and they're fast. So, but the guy explained like where to go, where not to be, where to stand, you know, like all, all else you fall curl up and just wait till somebody taps you and tell you that it's clear. Hmm. Okay. So what other high risk or adrenaline filled activities have you participated in? Zipline is not really, I wouldn't call scary. I'm afraid of heights. Are you? Uh, yeah, yeah. I have a fear of heights. I'm not jumping out of the airplanes. No skydiving. I would probably do it. Just the fear but I'm not, I'm not much of that. We're going to do Kilimanjaro. That's our next big adventure. There'll be something stupid every year after that until we can't do it anymore. It's not like every 10 years, like doing big birthdays? No, every year. We're going to do it. Because you think every 10 years, so I'm 52. I'll be 52 this year. So at 60, I won't be able to do that. So I need to get them in before 55 and we'll see. Any, got any ideas? Have you ever tried skiing? I've been to Black Ski Summit. In the mid nineties, I haven't been skiing since then. Okay, why not? Just no time. My parents you know, get married, and life life goes. Man. No, I'm just, I didn't have time, and then divorce, and so skiing might be an option. Is that is that considered uh, adrenaline? If you're doing black, so if you're jumping off mountains and they have the hella skiing, and it's, it's all kind of different levels you can do. Back country. Okay, I'll have to consider that. I'll put that on the list. I enjoy it. <laughs> it's fun. So you asked me about being an athlete. Again, I did a little baseball, but football and basketball in high school. Played football in college. Picked up boxing. About every five years, I'll pick up some new sport. So I try to do a blend. And so triathlon just happened to be the last one. Okay. You think you'll stick with triathlon or you think you'll pick up something else and let it go? I'm going to pick up some else. Those knees and ankles, just, yeah, I don't need an ACL or a, an Achilles. I'm just not ready to do rehab like that. So I just don't know how I did it. I had my, I had a torn meniscus this, uh, this fall. And your knees not bothering you? No, nah, it's fine. I've been running and training. I wish I knew how I did it, but maybe a small tear turned into a big tear. You're blessed. You're blessed. Yeah. Or maybe you see some people. I find in in training and in just they go too hard until they're injured versus kind of going hard enough in order to reach your goals. Sometimes it's a fine line between that. If I had to put my finger on it, I did a charity event. It's called uh, No Child Hungry, and it's out in Santa Clara, California. And we did two century rides in back to back days. If I had to put my finger on it, I probably tweaked it then. That's a lot of a lot of torque, and it was. The elevation was crazy. I think it was five or six K both days. It was not flat by any means. So that may have been it. And I, maybe I just didn't notice it. On your bucket list, as far as endurance racing, do you have any goals, aspirations other than just doing another Ironman? Not at the moment. I figured I would stop doing triathlons and then pick it up like kind of one last run. Mm-hmm. And I would like to actually train and try to do like, you know, for a half, I'd like to do 
under 5.30 for a full. I like to be in the 12, like be a daylight finisher, something like that. So that would be it. Not just to fin- I think I could finish based on the training, what I've done before, but actually train for a target number. I said, I struggle with the run. I think because I'm considered a Clydesdale by Ironman standards. So right now I'm about 215 and I'm tall. Like you've seen, the, they're mostly small, 5'9", 5'10", buck 50. Already a discipline. I'm never going to qualify for Kona, but I would love to just. You never know. I'd have to be in like the, the 65 and older league and just, you know, and if, I stay in shape to do. So I'm not that far if I want to do a race, but the goal is eventually to try to, to shoot for a target. Not a podium, just just a target of five and a half or under. Tell me about snake in the grass. Seems like it combines your <laughs> adventurous athletic experience with your acting, which is another hobby of yours. Yeah. I don't know. Have you ever had Max Fresnel on the show? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Max was on a show three years ago. It was called, I think it was called The Race. Or no, it was called Million Dollar Mile. Uh, I was actually supposed to be on Million Dollar Mile. I didn't get through the full auditions. When I did the audition tapes, somebody called me back and said, hey, I got this show. And I asked, honestly, they didn't give me many details. I thought it might have been Survivor. I was like, yeah, I'd love to do Survivor. That would be cool. Like, I don't know if I'm survivalist. I would love to be on a tropical island, you know, just having fun. It was a, a long process. It started in January, a bunch of stops and starts, and then finally we filmed in Costa Rica. I didn't like the premise of the show, honestly, because it was, I thought we were just going to be competing and then having this saboteur amongst us just kind of mess it up. It was just, you know, it was a lot of tension between castmates. Yeah, I could see that. Not really what I signed up for. So I was thinking, you know. So interestingly enough, I tell this jokingly, but it was a true story. As I'm waiting to get the call for um, Snake in the Grass, this lady calls me from California, some other casting company. She's like, hey. You want to go ahead and submit your paperwork for Naked and Afraid? I was like, I'm sorry. You know, it's the same production crew. She's like, you want to do Naked and Afraid? I was like, I'm not. It's like, oh, you'd be great. And she's sitting there. She's like, yeah, just same similar process. They want to make sure you're physically fit, mentally stable, all this stuff. It's like, yeah, you'd be. I'm thinking, are there any black people on Naked and Afraid? I've never watched the show. I've never watched the show. I've heard about it, but I don't think so. (laughs) Yeah, that's a funny story. So I'm like, no, I think I'm going to pass this time. I was like, okay, well. We got your stuff. You ever, ever want to consider it? Just let me know. You should do it. <laughs> Sound like my friends. I'm like, they wanted me to do it so they could just crack jokes about me. No, I mean, I, we'll, I, I would have watched the show if you were on it. <laughs> <laughs> Following up on that. So Snake in the Grass, the experience was cool. I've done some acting, mainly background, some small commercials and stuff, mostly non-speaking. So having the opportunity to like call your own shots was, was dip like, hey, yeah, I don't like that. Or, you know, they filmed, they cut. We didn't get any editing rights, but there was a couple of days that were just kind of long and hot that I was just like, I'm just ready to go back to the hotel. Can we reshoot this tomorrow? They're like, yeah, whatever, whatever you want. Okay. So how long did it take for you guys to shoot? We were there almost two weeks, but only we quarantined for four days. Like quarantined to the point where it was like the leper colony. Like they were, we were in rooms. They're like, do not leave this room. They come, they put your food on the doorstep. It was like a sweet patio type thing. They'd knock on the door. And even when they came to do anything, they'd be like 20 feet away. They're like, okay, we're about to send the testing person here. Just wait right there. And they pull up in the golf cart, fully masked, do it, and then leave. First four days were nothing. Then we were three days in the wilderness. Then we had kind of an off day. And then we had to come do some some TV stuff, like the the stuff for the commercials and the stuff for the intros leading in. They're actually disappointed because I saw one of the groups got to jump out of a helicopter. That would have been pretty cool. That would have been a bucket list item. Okay. So your experience wasn't what you thought it would be, but you, would you do it again if, if you had opportunity? I would do Survivor or some well-known show. I wouldn't do a new show with a new premise that has some gotcha. I don't, I don't want to do that. So. Was it a challenge, though, as far as the athletic part of it or not really? Um, no, they were pretty easy. Like there was no run. Like I don't the zip lining. I, I hate heights, but the other thing, what did we do? We did zip lining. We didn't have to swim, and then we did uh, this puzzle thing. Okay, a life lesson you learned in the midst of a race. Just focus. Like I know it's, it sounds cliche, but it's your why. You know, we we say that a lot. Why am I here? 
I will be successful. I want to push my body to limits. I want to tell my kids I did it. So both of my full races, my kids were there at the end. So that was the, I'm not getting in a golf cart or, or a, a van and getting taken to the finish line when it finishes. So that just having perseverance to get through stuff. And the other one, one of my favorite models is get comfortable being uncomfortable. You're in the saddle. Okay. I, I got another 70 miles. You better shift to do whatever. Or I got cramps. I got blisters. Okay. That's the norm. So that's probably my second favorite uh, quote. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. So part of my podcast is to have guests who've overcome obstacles to make it to their finish line. Can you tell me about an obstacle that you had to overcome, whether it be triathlon, sports, or just in life? Along the same time that I got divorced, my dad had also passed. So he had pancreatic cancer. So I had two things going at once and was diagnosed with grief depression or clinical depression. So then at that point, dad gone wife, kids kind of not seeing them every day. Things could have went really south. There was just a, a, a mental part of me that said, that's not what I want to do. I want to sit on the couch, get, get out of shape, be unhealthy and do these things. I needed to set goals and just being able to set a goal for myself. And I never intended to, to run an Ironman. That was just icing on the cake. But just to go through all that and say, hey, I was able to do this. So now you know, it's like a lifestyle. Like You don't I know very few people have done races and just stopped cold turkey. Usually there's another race or you're training or you like, you know what? I like the biking part. I'm just going to start biking or I, I really like running. I'm just going to start running. So, you know, it's, you, you get caught into the community. You know, it's a healthy lifestyle. People that are actually going to hold you accountable. So I got friends who are still like, Hey, let's go bike 50 miles. I'm not even barely training. They're like, yeah, let's do 50 miles this week. But guess what I'm doing? I'm getting up 7 a.m. and I'm, I'm riding 50 miles. So. That's good. That's one thing I like about the community is it's the, the relationship you form. And actually, I started running after my mom passed away with breast cancer. And I just started running to lose weight. The people and just the feeling just kind of help with my stress in, in life. I don't ever want to let that go. I don't run like I used to because my knees, I'm the poster child for injuries. So, but it's like I have to find other ways to get my adrenaline rush. But yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> I'm sure the skiing doesn't help the knees. Actually, I can ski, but I can't run. So it, it's not as bad on your knees. If you fall and injure yourself, that's another thing. But as far as the pounding and running, my knees can't tolerate. But I can ski. I might cannot go do moguls and all this, some crazy stuff, but I can do like just regular. So if you could go back in time and give a young David advice, what advice would you tell yourself? Well, that's an easy one. Something I tell my son all the time. Don't be afraid to fail. Fail young. You have time to recover. You learn from it. You know, like, I don't want to fail at something that, like, nothing serious. Like, I don't want to start a new career at 50. Could you have five different careers before you're 30? Absolutely. Find what you like, find what you don't like. School, don't be in any rush. You know, I know a lot of people who go to school, get degrees, and then hate their major or don't want to do it and then have to start, you know. So I tell them all the time, just, Go do this. Why? I'm, I'm not any good at it. That's the whole point. Go do something that you're not good at. You'll learn more about yourself. That would be the, the best advice because you, you, people are like, you don't want to do that. Then what are you going to do? Well, you start over. It's not not the worst thing in the world. You move to a different city. You find new friends. You do, you know, you do whatever. So don't be afraid to fail. Okay. So what's on your, you say you're training for a race. What race are you training for right now? I'm probably looking at uh, Gulf Coast. It's at May 17th. And that's a half or full? It's a half. It's going to take something extraordinary for me to do a full. I'd rather, you know, sit on a patio and smoke a cigar than doing a full as a lifestyle. I think a half is right. It's about six days a week. It's doable for me and what I want to do. I can hang out. I can move days around. Full, you miss too many days and you're like, I'm not going to make cut off. How was your experience in Louisville? Did, what, did you do it before? Was it hot? Well, you were there. It was cold. Remember, it, it was a staggered start. The swim got canceled. It was freezing cold, so they did it by numbers. I was like one of the last people to start, and I was freezing. It was like, what, 38, 39 at the start? And then it got a little warm, and it was hilly, more than I expected. Got done with that. And then when the sun set, it got colder again. So I like 
the weather. I mean, I needed some extra layers to start with, but by the middle of the bike, and I like heels. I love the bike. <laughs> I would do Louisville. I hated to run. I mean, I didn't like the run because they it was running through the parking lots and all that. They kept running out of chicken broth, too. But I loved the bike in Louisville. I really did. No, I hated it. There was that part where you're going downhill and you got to make a hard left and there were water bottles. I was like, yeah, somebody's going to die right here. And I have friends and family in uh, Louisville. On the drive there, I was like, oh, they canceled the swim. Like, I'm like, but you still got to do it. See, that was the point of cost of the swim. But other than that, and the, I really like to run. But I love the finish line. That's an awesome finish line. Yeah. Although I wish Mike Riley was there. But I love the finish line. And he mis- they mispronounced my name. But, <laughs> but yeah. So I would do Louisville again if it came back. That ain't happening. Are you doing any more races? Or are the knees not going to let you do it? Well, see... My issue right now is, well, my knees, I can't really run. So I've just, do, I've just been kind of walk running and doing my training now because it's too cold to ride outside of Chicago anyway. And I can't swim because I had my shoulders bothering me. I got a rotator cuff tear. So I might need to get that fixed. You have had some, some injuries. Okay. I do feel fortunate. Yeah. I told y'all I'm the poster child. And over the years, I've had a lot of running. I used to get all these chronic issues. I had a skin accident. I always messed up my knee to begin with. Then I had another. So I crashed trying to race. To see if I just ski normal without trying to do extra. Because I like racing and ski racing. You make skiing sound fun. I think I might have to pick up. I still got my ski gear. So. The summit. It's nice. When is the summit? Next week. Oh, I can't. I won't be on the summit. <laughs> <laughs> so any last minute words of advice for my listeners? Same thing. It's never too late to start. There are. African-Americans and people of color, they do triathlons, so don't let that discourage you. And join groups. I'm not on Facebook as much, but the uh, Black Triathletes group, you can find pockets of training sessions. And I remember we used to get together more, but you can find people and get advice and leverage that to achieve your goals. So I feel like triathlons are like that middle age thing. I've noticed that there aren't like a lot of 25 and, and under people run. There are some, but most of, most people are like people in their careers, type A personalities former military, things like that. But it's never too late to start. I remember getting passed by a couple of 70, 80-year-old ladies on the run in the bike, and they're just like, so I enjoy it. So again, it, and it's, it's one of those things that you, even if you don't finish the race, you get something out of it, just the training and the discipline to, to get it done. So that'd be my main advice. Like, again, try try something new. Don't hurt yourself. But try, try something new. If you're physically able, learn to swim. Go to the YMCA. Learn how to swim. Where can people find you if you want to be found? IG is probably my best. Wesley.Redmond at, it's just Wesley. I think that's it. I, I, you can try, I don't really use my IG that much, but uh, so you can post it in my bio. But yeah, uh, stay tuned. I think 2024, I won't say 20, 2024 will be my year that the acting thing should take off. I got a, I, I got some things lined up so that more to come. So more, it'll be kind of similar to survival or it'll be just, or it'll be. Oh, no, it'll be, it'll be better stuff. Yeah. It'll be actually, yeah. Real, real stuff. Real stuff. Okay. All right. Real stuff. All right. Check it out. That wraps up this episode of Running is Cheaper Than Therapy podcast. Thank you for tuning in. If you already haven't, please download Running is Cheaper Than Therapy podcast on Apple, Spotify, or however you listen to your favorite podcast. If you have any questions, concerns, or possible show topics, please email Running is Cheaper Than Therapy, OLB, Omaha Love Brown. Again, that's Running is Cheaper Than Therapy, Omaha Love Brown at gmail.com. I also can be reached via Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Handle We Life, We Love. OUI Life, OUI Love. Thank you, and please tune in again.